Hey, Fandos. Thanks for joining me on the first episode of Friday Night Right in two weeks. Thank you for hanging around and sticking with me and dealing with my massive illness. I really appreciate it. As you can tell, I'm sounding a little better, but not up to speed 100% yet. I'm really looking forward to this um, break that I apparently will be having next week after Monday because we just got the announcement that schools will be closing in Illinois on Tuesday and they will be closed from the 17th to the 30th of March. So looks like I'm going to have plenty of time for my voice to rest. So don't know how I feel about that yet. A lot of, there's a lot of things going on that, um, while we obviously don't want people to congregate and spread the illness, like there are so many consequences of those kids not being in school that we are now having to like scramble to figure out. So like, kids having access to lunches and breakfasts and having to implement um, virtual learning in a rural school district where not all of our kids have access to the internet and just the not knowing of things. And it's like, everything is so chaotic and crazy. Like we we literally found out um, about 30 minutes after we left work today, of course, We'd, we'd been having meetings every day after school that were like up to the minute updates from our superintendent um, because basically she's been attending meetings with other superintendents and representatives to our state and the governor and all the health departments and all of these things. Basically, we were operating on a day-to-day basis of whether we were going to be open or not. Like we just, we didn't know. It was kind of like with snow days, you wake up and you didn't get a call, so you go to work. Um, And then we found out officially that schools will be closed till the end of basically March. Um, Luckily, one of those weeks was our spring break anyway, so we, we really only have about two weeks that the kids will have to have virtual learning for, but it's like everything's chaotic, so it looks like I'm going to be working from home, um, which is weird. I've never taught from home before. I've never worked for a virtual school, so a lot of crazy shenanigans going on in my life right now, but at least I'll have time for my voice to get back up to speed, hopefully. I, I really don't want to sound like this for the rest of my life, and I'm starting to be afraid that I am. Um, I did switch up my drinks tonight though. Um, because of the crazy shenanigans, I'm, I'm enjoying an adult beverage tonight. (laughs) Usually I would drink tea with you guys on Fridays, but tonight it's definitely a stout night. So, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm glad to be back streaming and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back in the swing of things and having a consistent schedule again. But now I feel like everything else, now that I'm getting back to the consistency of what I had established here on Twitch everything else is going chaotic. So it's going to be an adventure. You guys will get fun updates, I guess, on Tuesdays and Fridays about what life's like teaching from home. So this will be a new adventure. So cheers. (laughs) But that being said, we have a follow-up episode tonight. What this episode was supposed to be was the follow-up to our scene writing episode from two weeks ago where I had talked all about how to set a scene and basically the purpose of a scene and how to set the emotional stakes of a scene and all of the things that go into that. And the homework that I had given you guys was to use these, um, organizers from the story genius, uh, from, uh, Lisa Cron to map out some of your scenes that you hadn't written yet. And so I have a variety of them in front of me here that I had written weeks ago of scenes that I have not actually written yet. Um, and then caught regular old flu, not coronavirus, but regular old flu and suddenly writing just stopped. So I have basically, these were frozen in time and I had to go through today when I was getting prepped for the show. And I started last night too, of making sure that I had enough that I had actually done. Um, cause normally I like to do the show prep well in advance. Um, I'm normally not prepping the day of, and I was doing that this time because Honestly, I just hadn't done anything on the show and I had, I had forgotten what we had talked about. So I had to go back and reread through, um, my show notes that I use for my outline for my last show to figure out what I had talked about in the last episode. So I didn't end up repeating myself a lot and had to do some prep work for tonight. So I have these to use as a tool to kind of explain how, if you have written these from our homework last time what you can do with the information I'm going to talk about tonight to basically figure out, have you set your purpose in your scene? Because tonight we're going to talk about the goal of scenes and we're going to talk about scene and sequel again, because they are two parts of a whole. Really 
when you're writing a scene, there are two components of that. There's the action component and then the reaction component. And especially if they're the big scenes, which I was reading today and um, one of the books that I was looking at when I was prepping for the show, um, trying to find some different information because I felt like I was using the same materials and I was going through other books trying to make sure that I was varying my sources enough to be giving you guys the best information I can be giving you. Um, but one of the things that I read is that normally in a, in a story, you're going to have about six major big scenes that are going to have some kind of impact emotionally or that are going to be turning points in your story, basically points of no return where the character cannot go back to the things, the way things were before. And so, um, with those big six scenes, you definitely have to make sure you have a follow-up sequel to that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what are your options when writing a sequel? So how are you going to set the conflict in that scene, define your purpose with the action, and then how do you follow that up? And then I've really broken down the sequel as I was reading more about sequel itself. I didn't realize how many components there were just in the follow-up to the fallout of an action sequence. So we're going to talk about all that tonight. So give me a second. I'm going to get my, my notes pulled back up since I had my screen big. And there we go. Okie dokie. So I officially, before I officially can't see the chat, let me just see. All right. Hi, Kit. Hi, Septic's back. Nice to see you, Septic. We were talking last week. Timber and I were talking about how we had missed you. We were hoping that you were going to come back. And Octavia's here. Okay, cool. So gang's all here. Let's do this. Closing my window to be tiny and got my script up. Okay, so scene goals. There is a big difference between the goal of your overall story, your plot goal, and the individual little goals that you should have within your scenes. We kind of ask a question at the beginning of a story when we are writing, and it's that, Chu King, thank you for following. Appreciate you tonight. So basically when you have your story, you, you're asking a big question of will the character reach their goal? What will they accomplish? Will they get what they want or what they need? Okay. And the story is answering that question. In the individual scene, you have smaller questions and there are smaller obstacles. So there are trying and failing consistently in action scenes, right? They're, they're attempting things, they're working through things, they're coming up short, they're making mistakes, they're doing whatever they have to do to fight their way to their goal, right? So we have our overarching goal of, I want my character to achieve this. This is what they want to be happy. We've got our underline, that through line we've talked about with those emotional stakes of, there's the thing that we establish our character wants, the underlying thing our character needs and a lot of that has to do with backstory, which I have decided is going to be my next episode. We're going to talk about backstory because that's one of the things that's particularly impacting me right now as I'm trying to write my first draft is weeding through the backstory that I have created. Because one of my problems as a writer is I create really backstory rich stories because I'm constantly writing stories that take place over long periods of time with multi-generations of like a family or groups of people or time periods. And so there's lots of backstory. Um, and one of my biggest obstacles as a writer personally is weeding through and figuring out what the reader needs to know. And I have a bad habit of not trusting the reader to be able to figure stuff out on their own. I constantly want to give them as much detail as possible. I honestly think that comes from being a teacher because I don't want to leave room for misunderstanding. Like I want to clarify and give as many examples as possible and demonstrate for my students. And I want, if I'm going to do something to teach them a new skill, I want to walk them through it and have them practice it. So like, I honestly feel like one of the problems with being a writer and a teacher is that I want to over explain everything just because that's what I do in my day job. So I have a really hard time trusting any reader that they're going to put the dots together. That if I don't connect the dots for them, they're not going to see the whole picture. When really, I just need to put the dots and they need to be the one to connect it. So um, all this week, I'm going to be, after this show, I'm going to be reading about backstory and 
creating an episode that talks specifically about why backstory is important and how all spec fic has to have backstory and then how you use that sparingly and reveal it through your story because one of the things that I know, especially talking from Kit who has read my first chapter, it's the most confusing feedback I got is that there was too much information and yet not enough at the same time. So like, how did I over explain and yet not explain enough? And so one of the chapters that I plotted out onto my cards was I want to try and write a new first chapter. I didn't want to do that originally because I don't want to go back and be rewriting stuff. I, I don't want to be editing in the drafting phase, but I got this really good idea. I want to try it. I'll write it out. I'll see what happens with it. But with, um, with backstory, it's really important to be able to feed that in. And so we're going to, we're going to talk about that in, a, in an upcoming episode. So the problem with your character's goal is that backstory is going to influence it. So what they want is based on what they think they, they need, but what they truly need is based on their backstory, the experiences they've had, the hardships, the people they've met, the setbacks they've had, all of that is part of backstory. And that's why it's important. And we're going to talk about it. And that all has to do with your overarching golden story. But in an individual scene, none of that really takes precedent. You're working towards that, but that's not what you're going to be talking about in the individual scene. You choose a smaller goal, a piece of the whole to try and work towards. That's when you practice your try fails, your attempts to move towards your goal and get what you want. And most of the time, until you get up to your climax, your character is going to be repeatedly failing over and over and over again. And you have to talk about that. The scene is all about the try and the fail. And then the sequel that follows that up is what your character does afterwards. How do they react? How do they make decisions based on knowing that this didn't work and how they move forward? Because that is your plot. That's your story. It's characters trying things, failing at them, thinking about them, trying something else based on that decision making process. And so that's why it's really important. So. Plot goals answer the big question of, will my character get what they want? But the internal story is, will they get what they need? And the scene goals are more immediate parts of that external goal. You can use the internal goal as part of it, but your, your scene goals are more immediate, smaller parts of that whole picture. So what does your character want? Your character wants something concrete. That's not necessarily what they need, but your character wants something concrete or something incorporeal like acknowledgement. They want to be worshipped. They want admiration and respect. Sometimes they just want to escape. Sometimes they want um, physical escape. Sometimes they want a mental escape. Maybe they just want a reprieve from not having to worry about something or they feel regret and shame about something. They want to escape the consu the consuming frustration of always having to deal with this problem. Um, whether it's something they've done or something that was out of their control. So maybe they're trying to escape grief. Like maybe they've lost someone or something and no matter what they do, they can't no matter where they look, they can't escape it. So your character has different wants, right? And that all has to do with your overarching plot goal. But you have to establish an immediate want too in that scene. So whatever your purpose of your scene is, whatever your character has to accomplish to move them forward in the story, you have to establish that. There are ways that you can get that established by showing how they're going to manifest that goal. So are they seeking information? Are they trying to hide? Are they trying to find something? Are they going to attempt something new, like a skill that they've never done before? Um, are they going to confront someone? Are they trying to fix something like whatever their 
trying to get to. They have to take an action to get to it, right? They can't just sit around and think, oh, I want this thing to happen, okay? So there are ways that you are going to get that goal to manifest, and that is by putting the character into action, making them do something, even if that's a conversation. There are a gamut of things that you can do from the physical to the mental, but save the emotional stuff for the follow-up. You don't want your character sitting around pining or regretting or being sad. That is what you do in the follow-up. After the action takes place, save the emotional stuff for the reaction. Now, you can have the, the emotional manifest physically like a fight, but if you're going to have the action be something based on an emotional reaction, you don't explain that in the sequence the action is taking place. You come back later and do a follow-up, okay? You get inside the character's head after they've thrown the punches and gotten the fight and the consequences of that fight have taken place, all right? Now you have to put them somewhere, whether they're in jail or they're alone by themselves or wherever they end up after this fight. The consequences have taken place. Now you have to give them time to think about what they've done. And that's where the emotional component comes up in the sequel. So when you are establishing your purpose for the scene, it is an action. It's something physical. It's something external. Even if it has an emotional component to it, you have to physically act on that emotion. But you're not wasting time explaining why they feel the way they do. It's immediate. Your job as the writer is to put obstacles in the way of them getting their goal. So they have to act, try, fail, and come back and come up with a new plan. The plan comes in the sequel, the follow-up, the immediate aftermath of the consequences. This sequence, these parts, are what create conflict and tension. That is what gets the reader sucked in. Knowing that, okay, this could be the time it works, and then it doesn't. And then trying to figure out, well, what the hell are they going to do now? Okay, that is what gets me because that's my favorite part of story is that I get sucked into trying to predict the outcome of trying to pr imagine that I'm as smart as the writer and that I can figure out what the story is. And even if I'm wrong, I'm okay with that because if I, if I predicted it, I feel like, oh, I'm smart, I got it. If I didn't get it, that means, oh man, I wasn't smart enough, but that means that it, this is really good, that I couldn't even figure it out, that it wasn't something I could easily predict. So, you know, there's like a surprise coming or something bigger. That's my favorite part of the story. Most people, that's what they're reading for, is they're, they get caught up in the cycle of trying to predict what happens next, okay? That's what invests you in a character, of being along with them for the ride, of you know they don't know what they're doing and you kind of feel like you don't know what you're doing and you're in it together. And that's why it's so important to set those emotional stakes, which is what we spent all last episode talking about is establishing those emotional stakes of getting attached to that character. And then once you've got the reader attached to that character, you have to take them along for a ride. Now, that being said, you can't just keep punching them with action, 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 action. That gets exhausting. Even though it's constantly movement, it's, it's, it's always something happening, that starts to feel monotonous. See, you can't do that either. You have to pace it. That's why pacing is so important. You give something fast, immediate, quick, physical, external, follow that up with something slow, internal, intellectual, emotional, okay? One of the things that you want to keep in mind is that at some point, just like if you keep hitting the reader over and over and over again with action, 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 they're gonna get frustrated. If the character never achieves anything, the reader is also gonna get frustrated. It's gonna feel very much like, well, why am I even trying? What's the point? They're never gonna get anywhere. So while you have to keep denying the character what they want, you have to give small victories. You can do that by limiting the victory. So maybe they try something and for the first time it works, but, there's an unforeseen consequence or 
it kind of worked. It didn't work as well as you thought, and you got halfway there, but you're not quite there. Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me, guys. Ugh. The coughing's a lot better this week. It's not nearly as bad as it was last week, and my chest congestion is almost gone. Like, the reason I'm not hacking and coughing so much anymore is because the chest congestion, my lungs are almost entirely clear of mucus, so that's really exciting. The problem I'm having now is that my sinuses are still congested. I have not been able to clear those out. And I'm getting really tired of blowing my nose. So hopefully I won't be hacking and blowing my nose as much as I was last week. But you're still going to have to deal with my sultry, smoky 1940s vixen voice, apparently. So, But getting back to what I was saying, some victory is needed. You have to give the reader something to hope for. Just like a person who is constantly hitting fail, 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 fail. Unless they're a very intrinsically motivated person, they're going to quit. Unless there is something that's truly motivating them, like especially in spec fic, when we have stories that have such big stakes where it's like the end of the world is imminent. If you know that you're the only person that can save the world, okay, obviously you're probably not going to quit on the world. But if the stakes are smaller and you're trying to accomplish something, you just keep hitting a wall, what's the point? You're going to give up. It's obvious. Everyone else can see that you can't do this. Why can't you? So just like you have to keep some hope within the character, you have to keep some hope alive within the reader too. And that's why you have to give some small portion of victory. The faster the character gets what they want though, the less tension you're going to have. So if you ratchet up the tension, that can also get exhausting. If you give your character what they want too early, you've completely blown the conflict. There's no more tension. The only way to keep that going, if you want to give your character something, if you want to have them, like, if you want to give them, like, breadcrumbs, small little, like, treats, think of it like E.T. with the Reese's Pieces. You have to keep laying more breadcrumbs for them to follow, so you give them small pieces. And you have to ratchet up the tension. So if they do achieve a victory and get something, then the next time they try, the consequences and the stakes have to be higher. So every time there's a try-fail cycle, the consequences for failing have to be bigger and bigger. Now, you can't do that too much to the point where it becomes ridiculous. Otherwise, like I said, readers will get exhausted or you lose credibility with them. Like, if you ratchet up the stakes too high too fast, that's not going to be believable. And even in spec fic, like science fiction and fantasy... We've already suspended our belief enough that magic exists or that massive sci-fi technology exists. The reader's belief can only be suspended to some so much, okay? We can we can allow magic to exist, but we can't let common everyday thing th like slip through the believability factor. So that's why it's important to have good pacing and know that you have to leave these breadcrumbs for them to follow. So small consistent obstacles that can be overcome with some kind of trial leading to the biggest obstacle at your climax. So you're moving your way up. And that's why when you guys see like the diagrams of a chart for the arc of a story, you've got that curve, right? And you hit your, your highest peak, your climax, and then you've got your denouement and your resolution at the end. So small, consistent goals that happen repeatedly. All right. So what are some of our options for establishing conflict? Obviously the most common one you're going to have is between two forces or people. If you're writing some kind of story, there is some kind of revol revolutionary movement or two oppositional sides trying to achieve a goal that are, you know, conflicting with each other. The obvious is have two people or two groups of people in direct opposition to each other. So direct opposition to a specific someone or a specific group of someones or even something. Maybe you're racing against a clock. Maybe you're trying to stop something from being built or something like a bomb from going off or, or whatever. So something is a direct obstacle to you, whether it's a person or an object or a ticking clock. Something like that, right? The opposite we have of that is sometimes it's not another person against you. 
Sometimes it's you against you. Now, I know that I had said that with sequel, that's where we want to have our internal emotional conflict, right? You can do internal struggle as an action if their emotional problem is preventing them from doing the action. So if you have somebody who is triggered because they have PTSD and they have something that made them remember the trauma and they've frozen and they have to stop a bomb, that's obviously like they were in the middle of an action and their emotional state stopped them from completing that action. So if the bomb goes off and something bad happens, there's consequences for that, that's your action. The sequel to that would be them going back and thinking about what triggered that reaction, why they reacted the way they did, how they could have avoided it, and then their plan, setting the plan for what they're going to do in the future to not be in that situation again. Um, A physical confrontation or a verbal confrontation. Maybe it's just two people. Maybe you start off with a conversation that turns into a fight. Um, I think of the scene in Guardians of the Galaxy where after Quill saves Gamora and they're picked up by the Ravagers and Groot and Drax and Rocket show up in the ship and threaten to blow them up if they don't turn them over, which is hilarious because it makes so much sense. But then they're all in that room where they're sitting around in like a circle and they're throwing out ideas and they just end up fighting with each other because they still don't kind of really like each other yet. So that is, you know, that's a perfect example of a verbal fight moving the story forward because they're in planning and trying and attempting things. So they're moving forward and having a conflict with each other. There are times when that can escalate to a physical fight. So the scene in Guardians where they're in the bar and they start verbally fighting and the next thing you know, Drax is attacking Rocket because he called him, I think because he called him a raccoon or a rat or something like that. So you can ratchet up the verbal to the physical very quickly or you can just stick with the verbal. You can start with the physical. You know, you can walk, your scene can start with someone walking in a room and throwing a punch. That's, that would be a pretty interesting way to start a chapter. So um, any kind of altercation you can have between uh, two or more people to get momentum going. Maybe your character is injured and they have to attempt to uh, accomplish their task while they're physically unable to do so. Just like they were inhibited by their emotional state. Maybe their physical injury is limiting them. Or maybe it's not even an injury. Maybe it's an illness. Um, if you are if you're diabetic and your blood sugar spikes, that's going to make things really hard for you when you're trying to accomplish a task. Or if you're asthmatic. Um, the scene from Signs is a really good example of that. Where um, they do all of the foreshadowing of the kid always having his inhaler and having to do his breathing treatment. And then in the climax, what happens is he doesn't have his inhaler and he is prevented from, you know, doing what he needs to do because he's physically incapacitated just because he can't breathe. Um, let's see. Maybe you lack something. Your character needs something, but they forgot it or it broke or they don't know where to find it. It's lost. So they, they need something to accomplish the task, but they're lacking in it. So either they have to go out and find it or they have to fix it within time periods, something like that. Uh, fear, which goes back to our emotional thing, maybe just like I said, if they're traumatized and they're not able to go through and complete their task. Any kind of interference. Um, think about any chase scene in a movie where there's somebody trying to get away and they go through a stoplight and a, re- a red light pops up and then suddenly whoever was chasing them is stopped by traffic. That is just interference, normal everyday interference. That's not anything having to do with opposition from a force in the story. That's just a random occurrence that happens that makes it harder for you to do what you need to do. So when I'm trying to get to work and I'm already running late and then I am driving towards the interstate and by the time that I'm on the off, the I am on the on ramp to get on the interstate and then I notice that traffic has stopped and it's too late for me to get off. I'm just all I can do is move forward into that traffic jam. That That is interference into my day. That has nothing to do with why I'm late or what I'm going to do when I get to work. It's just inhibiting my momentum in this moment. 
Um, another one is passive aggression. So basically, any time that you have a character with another character who is just making their life harder, they're not fighting them. They're not physically or verbally fighting them. They're just making things hard for them. Maybe the character that is lacking something lacks something because the character that is being passive aggressive toward them took whatever they needed and didn't tell them about it. So they just hit it. I've done that before <laughs> when I've been mad at people work. I've definitely hidden copies of people that I don't like at work. <laughs> like, oh, oh, you were a dick to me. I'm just going to take these copies from the copy machine and we're going to put them on the table and see how long it takes for you to find them. Or I've never thrown them away. I've never been that mean, but I've definitely made it harder for people to find the copies because we have one copy machine that all the teachers use. <laughs> so if you're ever mean to me, I've, I've probably been passive aggressive to you and you just don't know it. <laughs> but then again, I'm also the type of person that if I'm mad at you, you're going to know it. So that would obviously make someone's life harder. So if they really needed those copies and they waited to the last minute to make those copies and then they get down the copy machine and they're not on the copier because they've been relocated, that's going to make your life difficult. So there are lots of options for establishing a conflict, an obstacle that isn't necessarily the main goal that you're trying to get to. It's just a small, <coughs> a small goal that you have to achieve to get to the bigger obstacle that you want to overcome, which is what is going to be saved till your climax. So all of these things create disaster within a scene, right? So something happens that inhibits your character from achieving whatever they thought they were going to achieve in the scene. My favorite form of this is the yes, but. So when I was talking about giving those little bitty victories, give them a taste of hope and then throw another consequence at them. Something they did not realize was going to be a problem. Something that is maybe a bigger problem creates a secondary problem that they're going to have to sidestep to get what they want. That partial victory feels hollow in a way when you can't, when like you got so close and then this happened instead, right? So I really think that that is great for building tension because it, in me, my favorite thing about reading, like the reason I read fan fiction a lot or my favorite movies are ones that have angst in them. That's what I love so much about Guardians is that there's comedy along with the angst. And I think the best way to do that is a yes, but, and that's, you got so close, but then this huge setback happens as a result that maybe you took one step forward, but now you're falling two steps back as a result of this attempt you made. So characters achieve their goals, but discover that there are strings attached essentially, and that this isn't what they wanted. This isn't what they needed. Um, whatever is going to happen now, like maybe this, sometimes this establishes subplots that creates another thing. They have to solve this before they can get back to the main plot of, um, trying to accomplish their goal. So you can either have a partial or a complete obstruction to their goal. You can sidetrack them. You can divert them. You can confuse them. Um, you can give them what I, like I said, a hollow victory or what's known as a, a Pyrrhic victory. So, the idea of a Pyrrhic victory is that um, in ancient Greece, you had two armies fighting and both sides took such heavy losses that even the side that won, it wasn't really a victory for them. They lost just as many people as the other side. And so what's the point of celebrating a victory in war when you've lost so much as a consequence? So those hollow Pyrrhic victories. Um, Maybe they do get what they want, but they made a tragic mistake. They made an error in their calculation or maybe getting what they want in the course of doing that. They pissed the wrong person off. They miscalculated something, something that they did to get their victory now has a consequence in a way that has gone horribly wrong for people that are not just them. Maybe there are ulterior consequences to people that were innocent in the whole thing. And so now they have this guilt and shame of 
I got what I wanted, but this happened. So it's a very pyrrhic victory. Or I did this, this horrible thing happened, and I still didn't get what I want. So now I'm still without what I needed, still without what I want, and I don't have anything to show for it. And other people got hurt. And then the ultimate one, obviously, is death or injury. You want to save those for very limited circumstances, especially if it's a main character death. You obviously can't just throw that around willy-nilly. Um, but even side characters, you have to use deaths appropriately. You can't just kill anybody off. So, like, think about people like Joss Whedon, who are notorious for killing off beloved characters, but they do it in such a way that you almost can't even be angry at them for it. Like, they, they do it so well, so appropriately, that the impact and the punch when it happens is tenfold because it was such a thoughtful way of doing it or it was such a painful way of doing it. So if you're going to injure your character, think about the long-term consequences of that, especially the inconvenience of you having to write it. So like if you injure a character and you break their leg, well, it's going to take weeks for a leg to heal, okay? You have to think if you want to create an obstacle that's an injury, it has to be something that is going to be manageable for you as a writer. So unless it is a major part of the story that they have this weeks and weeks of healing, be very thoughtful and conscientious about how you're going to end your character and how they're going to get out of their, their situation because of that. And by injuring them, are you making it impossible for them to reach that goal down the line that suddenly now you're going to have to pull a deus ex machina out of nowhere to like suddenly like, oh, someone magically heals them or they drink a potion or some form of technology comes in and now they can walk again. Like, you have to be thoughtful about how you're going to use an injury because of it just not being something that you can fix believably like that. That's going to lose credibility with the reader as well. So that leads me up to sequel. So I want to, I want to pause there mostly because I want to take a drink. I'm going to see what's going on in the chat over here. Oh, Kit and Octavia, what are we talking about in here? Okay. Let me scroll back up a little bit. Do, 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 do. Yes, Kit, you do need to set up notifications so when this starts. But I'm always going to start around 7. I don't start right at 7 because I figure people aren't, like, nerdy about it. <laughs> so I'm never going to start right at 7. I'm always going to leave you guys some leeway of uh, a couple of minutes to, like, show up. So don't ever worry about, like being here right at seven or feeling like you're going to miss anything within the first couple of minutes. Mostly it's just going to be me talking about my day or complaining about my day or whatever. So, um, I'm always going to give you guys a couple of minutes to like come in at your own pace before I really get like the momentum going. So the goal is to make your characters die a little bit inside. Yeah. I like that. That's why I love ink so much because I feel like I have so much deadness inside that I, I relate to characters that also have that. There are two types of writers, people who don't prepare for writing and people with scenes trapped, taped, or sorry, taped on their walls, strung together by yarn, thumbtacks, you know, crazy people. So one of the arguments that I know that we've had in chat is that um, some people don't prep and I don't understand how you can be a writer and not prep. I don't feel like you can create a truly synchronized story without prep. And I say that as a person who has prepped every story I've ever written and still not finished one <laughs> because I've had to go back and fix stuff. So if I'm doing the prep work and I'm still finding holes, I don't know how not prepping, you're not going to have holes. Like, it's just impossible to me. Um, I cannot remember where I was reading it. It was probably in my Lisa Cron book, or I think she was talking about people who intrinsically have the ability to craft story. And I just don't think there are enough of them in the world to be able to just intrinsically know the components of, of proper successful storytelling to be able to not plan their stuff out. I just, I don't believe it. Uh, we ask a question at the beginning of a story and it's that <laughs> chuking that you for fall what? Octavia, I'm totally confused by that. <laughs> Your job as a writer is to tell an entertaining story and not give a tutorial story. So, yeah. So, that's what I'm struggling with. Like I said, as a writer, 
I'm not a teacher and that's really hard because it's been ingrained in me from day one of teacher school basically how to teach a person how to understand a concept and it's really hard for me not to translate that into writing because I want to make everything so plain and so accessible for my students to not do that in writing is a challenge for me. So let's see. You can't always get what you want, but if you try some time, you just might find you get what you need. Don't quote that in a book. <laughs> you see your ass off. I believe it. <laughs> Don't quote any songs. No. You know, one of the things that I think about when I'm writing, um, especially because in my other story that I was writing, I use a lot of pop culture references and I'm always worried about my pop culture references. So even if I'm not quoting a song, if I mention a movie or if I use the word Pepsi, you know, like, am I going to get in trouble for that? So I'm always constantly worried about it. one of these days I should really look into what the rights are and protections on that. So rules are always made to be bent under the guise of as long as it works. <laughs> Stephen King said that he puts characters into uncomfortable situations and waits for them to figure a way out of it. That's true. The problem is if I wait for a character to figure it out, <laughs> that's, it's just not going to happen. Like, I feel like maybe it goes back to what I was talking about where I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure out how to explain everything. I feel like I have to figure out everything for my characters, every possible scenario and escape for them to be able to truly determine and figure out how they're going to get out of their problem. <laughs> I like how you reference that uh, Dragon Ball Z as you can't keep punching them with action, action, action. Dragon Ball Z still doing fine. Um, yeah, it might still be on, but I don't know a lot of people who are both anime fans and Dragon Ball Z fans. I feel like there are Dragon Ball Z fans and that's it. Like, even people that are fans and watch Dragon Ball Z are the first to admit it's a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, they know the problems with it. It's anyone who watches it and is intelligent enough to know that there are problems with it are, are just watching it as like a guilty pleasure. So I don't know if it's doing fine. I think, I don't know. Maybe it's not on, it's not on prime time. It's only on Toonami here. So whatever. There's a real irony to you trying to predict stories and feel smarter than the writer. Then yourself have to admit that you're not allowing that by over explaining it. I know. And that's the problem is there are, you know, there's the whole concept of being able to do something and, and being able to experience something. So I know that that's what I enjoy, but at the same time, there's the constant voice in the back of my head of maybe the writer that wrote that story was just really good at setting up the premise enough for me to connect the dots. What if I'm not a good enough writer to be able to put those dots in a way that makes sense. Like I'm constantly worried about leaving holes that are going to confuse my reader and make it impossible for them to go back and connect those dots later. So yes, you have to give the reader something to hope for. That's the problem with Magia site versus Madoki Magica. I don't know what that reference is, Octavia. You're going to have to help me with that one. So is that a book or a show? I don't know those. So, unless it's another anime reference. And if it's another anime reference, then I absolutely don't know it because I do not watch anime. I would not consider myself an anime fan. I have never found an anime that really resonates with me. So. Oh, how are we doing out in the world, people? Are we feeling well? Are we keeping ourselves healthy? Are we scared to death? I just don't know what's going on anymore. So, I stopped today to get gas. And I know the economy is like tanking and everything shut down. But where I live, gas was $1.90 today. I can't remember the last time I saw gas under $2. That just seems weird to me. So is that like the one thing that we get? <laughs> like that's that's our one reprieve is that the world's descending into chaos around us, but gas is going to be cheap for this week. <laughs> the economy's tanking. Give them some cheaper gas. I don't know. That just doesn't make any sense to me. If the, You think if things are getting harder and everything is going away that resources like that are going to get more expensive. But I guess I just don't understand how the economy works. So 
So it looks like we lost one. Sorry to hear that. So just to, so you guys know on Fridays, I don't do a lot of communicating on Fridays. Fridays are for your teaching and Tuesdays are for communicating. So if you're upset that I'm not hanging out a lot in the chat, that's why I've addressed that. So sorry, Fridays are for teaching and talking um, and giving lessons and Tuesdays are for the open communication. So I'm sorry if there's a miscommunication about that, but I've established that. So sorry if that's not what you were looking for. Come back another time, maybe hang it on Tuesdays. So that being said, let me go back and talk about scene and sequel. So I have established that with scenes, we have action. We have physical action, right? Something external has to happen. On the follow-up to that, we have to have a emotional reaction. Something has to take place where you slow down, the character steps away, and really thinks about what is going on, what they've done, and what they're going to do moving forward. How are they going to make a decision to go into the next phase of the story? So sequel is so much more than I thought it was because I really thought like, okay, you just give some space for the character to talk with somebody else or to internalize and do some monologue on their own. But after reading um, Cam Weiland's book about structuring your novel, she really compartmentalizes sequel. Like there's more I would say that goes into sequel than goes into scene itself. And that really kind of blew my mind. So scenes are all about action, external, physical. The disaster happens and the characters will have to react to that, correct? Sequels are all about that reaction. They are internal, they are emotional, and they have three parts. They have the reaction, which is the emotional expression, the dilemma, which is intellectual, it's the thinking about how they ended up in this situation and how they're gonna get out of it, and then the decision, the plan, the action, the one action component of this is what they're going to do to move forward. So they're going to make a conscious decision and move towards something else. So there are so many different options for things that you can do here. So in her book, she really breaks down. She has just a couple chapters about scene. She has like two. And then the next like five chapters are options for all of these different three things. So options for reaction, options for dilemma, and options for decision. So there's going to be a lot coming at you here, okay? You have established your scene. The action has taken place. The problem, the consequence, whatever has happened, right? You move into the next component. Now the character has time to reflect. They are going to feel something first. They might start to feel something in the action sequence of the scene, but you're not going to take time to really examine it until you get to the sequel, the follow-up part. There are a multitude of different emotions, depending on what has happened in the scene, that your character can feel. Everything, I mean, just, just pick the emotional spectrum. You can have everything from happiness to sadness, to anger, to confusion, despair, shame, regret, panic, shock, you know, whatever establish that immediately when you get into your sequel and, and express that either through the physical, like crying or laughing, or it, like I said, if you want to dramatize it in a way that shows that they react to anger by punching or something like that, the first thing you have to do immediately following a disaster is you have to relay the emotion the character is feeling from that happening. Dialogue, description, if you want to have internal monologue, or the physical dramatized emotional response. Once you have established that response, your character is going to process an emotion and then immediately start thinking. And that's a natural reaction. That's exactly what I would go through. That, that feels like the exact explanation of what anxiety is, is 
I have this emotional response. Now I'm going to start thinking about why I feel the way I do. So you have to also establish the process of them thinking. What are they going to do now? So you're almost going to review what happened. Obviously not in a way that is repeating exactly what we just read. Whether the, the sequel is the second part of the same chapter and you've just broken it down with like a page break or it's a separate chapter itself, it's still fresh in the reader's mind. The only time that you're going to have to go through and give it a real description of what they've already experienced is if you end the action and then go to a different point of view or jump somewhere else and then suddenly we're not in that perspective anymore. So unless you have to go back and do a recap, don't spend a lot of time reviewing what has happened. The character or the reader is going to have that pretty fresh in their mind. So once you've established they're in thinking mode, it's important to show their process, whether they're asking themselves questions or they're talking to someone and asking questions, or maybe they're just making a list internally. Maybe they're physically making a list. Whatever is happening, you have to show their process because once again, this is establishing credibility with the reader. When writing spec fic like I do, we already have that suspension of belief. We also are trying to deal with showing that plot is a series of events that are not arbitrary. They're cause and effect. I've talked all about that in other episodes. So it's this, this sequence of events that one thing leads to another, right? This also has to show that it is not arbitrary. And by pacing out the thinking process, it's going to show that it is not just a random string of events, that everything has a link in a chain that leads from one thing to another. This is going to help establish that your plot is logic based rather than feeling like a random string of events. This is a good place to focus back on try and fail and maybe talk a little bit about that cycle. Whatever you're doing, you have to show how the character is analyzing and reviewing what has happened. If you want to do that from how did this happen or what exactly happened or what are the consequences of this now, show some kind of analysis within the character. Then you're going to define the dilemma, the who, the what, the when, the why, whatever. The five W's are pretty good with this, right? So you're going to define it, analyze now what, this has happened, what are my options? You can do that a character thinking internally. You can do that by a character talking with somebody else. The whole scene in um, Guardians where they're having these conversations is basically laying out our options. We've tried this. We've tried that. This didn't work. What are we going to do? That's stupid. You're an idiot. Let's fight. No, let's not. Like all of this is part of this analysis. And then eventually the what and the how come out from going through your options from talking to people or making your list internally or even if you're just trying to work with something maybe you're searching something on the on a computer or you're trying to fix something you know quick in time you establish the what and the how and you've made your plan that's your decision once you've established your decision your sequel is complete so you've got your three components in a sequel reaction Dilemma, and then decision. Reaction is emotional. Dilemma is intellectual. And then the decision is more, it's not really, I don't want to, I don't want to call it an action. That's not the right way to describe that. It really is just, okay, this is what we're going to do. It's, it's, it's the plan. It's a concrete thing of this is how we're going to move forward. So what are our options for a decision? A decision has to reflect the cause and effect. You can't come to one conclusion randomly when it has nothing to do with what just happened. So if you aren't relating back the decision the character is making back to the effects and consequence of what just happened in the scene before it, in the action sequence, that's going to feel disconnected. Your reader is going to be confused. And you're going to have to establish that there is a reasoning for that. So make sure that you're clarifying on that. 
avoid easily achievable decisions. You don't want something that's so easy that it was obvious or that there's not going to be any tension in trying to achieve it or that by achieving it so quickly, you've now completely ruined all of the other stuff that you have set up that you're trying to move towards. So make it, uh, going back to what we were talking about with those small digestible pieces. So avoid easily achievable decisions and focus on your long-term goal. You still are trying to get towards something. You're just doing it through a short-term fix. So now we have to go back and try something else or we have to deal with the consequences of something. This is the what, this is the how, this is what we're going to do it. So you are going to establish those three things in a sequel for it to be successful and for it to give reasoning and meaning to the thing that just occurred before it. If you have this really impactful scene, especially if you're going to do something so dramatic as like a major injury or a character dying off, and then you don't follow that up with a sequel where you're examining what just happened. You're not giving context and meaning to the reader. You're not being fair to the reader because that is where the story lies. That analysis, that emotional examination, that's where our emotional stakes are. That's where the true loss for the character is going to be. Yes, they didn't get what they wanted, but they also didn't get what they needed. And that's where the empathy comes from. That's where the character relationship comes from with the reader. This is so important. If you're not doing this, especially after your major turning point scenes, you're doing a disservice to your story. So it's really important that you follow big sequences up with a sequel. It's also important that you follow up littler sequences up. Anytime there's a major action that's taken place that creates a turning point or creates something, a change in the character, you have to establish how they're going to react to that. It's, it's a very important component. So that's why my homework this week is going to be going through and figuring out on my outline where those scenes are and where those sequels are, because I want to make sure that for every time I've established a scene that's truly important, I have followed it up and given ample time for the reader to truly analyze and, and deal with that experience alongside the reader. Okay. Last thing that I truly want to talk about tonight. I feel like I went really fast tonight. Maybe it's because I was trying to rush through because I just don't have a voice, but one of the things that I want to talk about with backstory is that we so usually rely on prologues and flashbacks to do that. But that's also something that we have here as an element of scenes. And so I'm going to kind of talk about flashbacks tonight a little bit as an option for a scene, but I think I'm going to delve more into it next week when I talk about backstory, because I feel like this is a tool that people really heavily rely on for falling back into telling backstory. And I'd really honestly like to have a conversation with other writers about what my options for doing that or my options for avoiding that are because I want to avoid, I don't want to write prologues and I don't want to rely heavily on flashbacks, especially for characters that are outside my main character because so much of their backstory is impacting my main character because of decisions and actions they've taken. So I'd like to have like an actual conversation at some point about using flashbacks. Um, because I would like to really brainstorm some new ideas. So maybe that'd be a good thing for Tuesday before we jump into backstory next Friday. But as kind of like a segue into what we're going to talk about next week, backstory is everything that happens prior to your story starting. It's sometimes called pre-story. And flashbacks are a specific scene that deliver backstory. Um, that can be everything from a sentence to a full-on chapter like when we have the Harry Potter uh, flashbacks with the Pensieve where you're seeing Slughorn or you're seeing the memories of Snape. So those are full on flashbacks. Those are their own scenes. They function just like scene and sequel. The way they would work would be the flashback would be the scene and then your character is going to react in a sequel to what they've just learned or what they've remembered. So specifically with Harry Potter, he was not experiencing his own memories. He was watching other people's memories, but it's still a flashback because it's giving backstory that's going to be relevant to Harry's story, right? So 
backstory is history. It's culture. It's expectations. It's past mistakes made by characters. It's all of the things that have established who your character is or whichever character you're talking about, whether it's your main character or in like this other circumstance. We learned a lot about Snape's character in that flashback and it helped Harry make choices moving forward in his story. So when you're using a flashback, there are a specific thing you need to do within a scene. If you're going to use a flashback to deliver backstory as a scene, one of the things that's very important for you to do is that you have to establish the shift by using some kind of trigger. So it's really important to make something, an object, a person, or some kind of sensory stimulation, whether it's a sound, whether it's a smell, um, whether you, you know, you just look at an object and you remember something that trigger has to be the shift to, for the reader to know that we are moving from the present into a time period that is not the one we are currently in. Now that can be very jarring and some people don't like flashbacks for that reason, but you have to ground the flashback if you're going to do that. And you have to treat a flashback just like a scene because that's essentially what it is. Unless you are doing something like you're just dropping a little bit of an information, like in, like a sentence or something like that. If you're going to go and, and spend this time to dedicate an entire flashback, if it's a long part of a story that you are literally going to take the reader from the moment in time they're at and drop them in another setting so they can experience this live action memory, you have to ground it with a trigger. You have to show them that it's shifting. Whether that is something that at the end of one chapter or one scene, you've triggered it and then maybe you jump with a page break or another chapter and then the entire other chapter, this entire other break is in you know italics or whatever so the reader clearly knows that this is a flashback or a memory or whatever. But then when you're done with that, you have to re-trigger the reader to come back into the present time. So it's really important that you ground this moment in time if you're going to create an entire scene based on a flashback. Because the reader has to know that that shift is going on. Otherwise, they're going to be really confused. Because I would miss something like that. If there wasn't a trigger, if you just started talking in a flashback, I would probably miss that. I, I read really fast and I catch myself having to go back and go, okay, what did I miss? Because now we're talking about the past. So make sure that you're grounding yourself when you're going to use a flashback as an entire scene. And once the character remembers what they need to flash back to, or if they're experiencing the flashback of another character and that information is going to be relayed to them, which is what I'm worried I'm going to end up having to do in my story is these other characters are going to have to relay their memories to the character. And instead of them telling the story to the character, I don't necessarily want to just give them in dialogue what happened. I'm thinking about just writing the next, like, okay, the character goes to start to tell a story, the scene ends, and then the next scene is that memory. I don't know if that's the best course of action. We'll, we'll see. I, I'm still far to that point. So, homework for this week. This is what I'm going to go do. I am going to go back through my outline. And I am going to determine my most important scenes. So somewhere around six turning points, right? I should have six really important scenes. Things where once they happen, the character cannot go back. Then I'm going to make sure that every one of those really important scenes, and it might be more, it might be less, it might be, you know, it might be five, it might be seven, whatever. I'm just going to shoot for around six. I'm going to make sure that every major scene in my story that is a turning point is followed by something that can work as a sequel. Even if I haven't fit it into my outline. And my problem is my story already feels like forever long as it is. I think I've got 60 scenes plotted out so far. Um, I have to go back and do that, even if it makes my story longer, because it will be a disservice to the reader in the story if I don't. So for all other scenes in the outline, I'm going to determine whether it's a scene or a sequel. And for every scene, I'm going to identify my goal, what my purpose is, which if you're already using these guys, 
That's what you have up here. You've got your scene and then you've got your objective. What do you want to accomplish within that scene? So I'm going to make sure that everything that I have plotted out so far has a purpose. And then after I've identified the goal, what action I'm going to take and how does this move the story forward, I'm going to look and make sure that every sequel has the three parts that I have established what their emotional reaction is going to be, the dilemma that they're facing and how they're, they're analyzing that, and then the decision that spurs them forward into the next scene. So that's your homework for this week if you're following along with me at home. You're going to go back through your outline. You're going to determine all of your scenes, all of your sequels, your really important ones, and make sure that any turning point has a sequel to it. And then make sure that for every scene, I've identified my goal. And for every sequel, I've identified the reaction, the dilemma, and the decision. So that's what I'm going to do for this week. Looks like I'm definitely going to have a lot of time to get it done. <laughs> So, hey, Timber, nice of you to join us. Oh, so tonight was a really short episode. I apologize for that. I felt like I had a lot more to talk about, but I just kind of flew through it tonight. Oh, my gosh. Let's catch up. What's going on here? Why not just have another character explain a story to your character? So I've done that. And the problem is it starts to feel like an info dump. If you just have a character explaining to another character and you can also fall into the trap of the, um, the, as you know, Joe. Um, so like, because a character in a story might already have the knowledge in the world, but the reader doesn't, a lot of times what people will do is they'll create this really disingenuous conversation between two characters that probably would already have this information. Like it would probably be part of like cultural or historical common knowledge and then they feel like they're explaining it in a very non-natural way so like i said that's where you if you've ever watched any old movies or shows and you hear as you know such and such happened on blah 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 so that's part of the problem that we have when we have characters explain stories to other characters is that that character probably already knows that but the reader doesn't so one of the things that i worry about a lot of times is things that the reader doesn't know Versus things that my character doesn't know, don't know, doesn't, don't, wow. Things my characters don't know versus things my readers don't know. Which of those things are the same and which of those things are separate? Because if my character should know something, then no one should be explaining that thing to them in the world. Unless they have misunderstood it. So if you have a new character introduced, that's a good opportunity for a character to explain something to them. And I do have a character that gets introduced um, a couple chapters in, and I have used that as a device to be like, how come you don't know that? You know, so my character was isolated. He was in prison for a while. So he's obviously been out of the world. So thing, and he lives in a different part of the world. He's never been to the city that he gets taken to. So like having him as a character who was out of the natural setting creates an opportunity for me to use him as a device to explain things in a natural way that the reader doesn't feel like is disingenuous. So that's why. Septic. When an old man talks to Bran and tells him the story of the past. See, the problem you have with that is in a show, it's going to be like in the physical show, it's different. It's a visual element. But if you're reading it in the books and I've, I've never read the Lord, the Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones books, that's where you just, it still feels like an info dump. If someone is just telling a story and it's a long story, then it's no different than me just dumping that into a narrative. So you have to be careful that you're going to fall into the same exact traps. So <laughs> what if a bard made a song? Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. I Have you been watching Witcher? Is that why? <laughs> now... If it's something where you're like in a bar and a bard is singing it like in the background, okay, that, that, I can see that working, but that would be a very specific instance that you would have to work in and you'd have to time it that they're in the bar with the bard singing at the right time for them to get the information. And chances are, if it's something the bard's singing about, it's cultural knowledge anyway, so it's probably something they already collectively know anyway. It's a slippery slope. You just got to be careful with it.
Oh, yes. So, how are we doing, Timber? Are you excited about school not being in session? <laughs> Even though technically we have school, we just aren't physically there. Oh, this virtual learning is going to be very, very difficult. Um, I feel like, like I was genuinely at one point today thinking about my two students that I have in my English class, having them log into Twitch because I know that they both have Twitch accounts and just because we're reading a novel together. At one point, I genuinely thought, what if I just got on Twitch and read the novel to them? <laughs> like we could just do that as class because I know both of them have access to it. Like that's, that's kind of where I'm at. So there's just, there's so much going on and chaos in the world and I don't really know what's going to happen. So, but I know that I'll be here. I'm going to st still keep streaming. You have to get reminded on, oh, you have to get reminded on your tablet. I gotcha. Sorry. Well, I feel like I have delivered my lesson for tonight. I'm already starting to feel like I'm losing my voice again. So I'm going to finish off my drink and then I'm probably going to skedaddle on you. So it's an early night, guys, and I apologize for that. But it's just, it's been a week, man. Not going to lie, if I had to do that, I wouldn't as a student. If you had to log on, well, you won't get credit for it then. So, because here's the thing. One of the things we're going to have to do is because we're still technically in session, we're just not physically in session, we still have to take attendance and the kids have to log in as part of the attendance. And if they don't log in and if they don't do the work, then they don't get credit for it. And if we're out for weeks and you miss weeks of work and you don't get credit for it, that means you're not going to pass the class and you're going to have to retake it and then you're not going to be on time for graduation. Like, there are long-term consequences for that. <laughs> that wouldn't have bothered you much at school. Well, I am concerned that you failing is not bothersome to you, but we all have different opinions and priorities when it comes to school. So as a teacher, that, that makes me sad that you not getting credit and being able to graduate on time would not have bothered you. So that's that's unfortunate. I'm sorry that you had such a poor experience in school, Septic. You, every time we talk about school, you never seem to express that you had a very good experience there. So as a teacher, I apologize for that. I, I'm sorry that you didn't have a successful experience there. And that's that's truly unfortunate. I wish that you would have had better. You deserved better. So. Okie dokie. I think that's all for me tonight. I think I'm going to log out and maybe start reading some of my prep work for Backstory next week. So Tuesday, I would, I'll would i probably try and have a conversation about um, flashbacks and backstory just as an introduction for next week, just to kind of get some ideas because there's, there's there, it's, I feel like there's got to be more ways, there's better ways to do it than just prologue, flashback. I feel like there's got to be more options than that. So Hopefully the writers in the chat can can give me some options because I feel like, I don't know, I, I feel like this flu has just really scrambled my brain and I'm just not as sharp as I have been in the last couple of weeks. I feel like I'm in slow mode and when I read things or when I try to problem solve things, I'm just not there all the way. So I don't know. I hear when pregnant women talk about having baby brain and they're just really slow on the uptake. I kind of feel like that's where I'm at right now. And I just really want to get out of that mode. So hopefully when my voice starts coming back, so does my cognitive faculties. And I'm up to speed by the time that we have this. <laughs> so, okay, guys, I'll see you on Tuesday. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. I will download this and I'll get it posted up on YouTube. So if you came into the stream late and you want to watch the rest of the episode, you can do that on YouTube. So, excuse me. I will see you Tuesday. Hopefully I'm feeling better. And the world's a little less chaotic. I'll see you guys then.